All right, uh, welcome back, uh, everybody. So now, after a brief uh, break and discussing a game industry ecosystem in um, Helsinki, we will move to the even more broader global topic, and we will talk about uh, digital platforms. So, and uh, as a speaker, we have Professor Bengt Holmström from MIT. Uh, Bengt uh, is known uh, in the economics community uh, globally for his work in contract theory, and partic particularly in the principal agent um, um, dilemmas. He received uh, for his work a Nobel uh, Memorial Prize in economics in 2016. Uh, in addition to MIT, which is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Bengt has also talked at uh, Yale University, uh, Northwestern University, um, and uh, he did his uh, PhD work uh, at Stanford uh, University. And Bengt uh, has uh, been at the Estonian Business School's Styling Campus a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and now we are very happy to welcome you at uh, our uh, new campus here in Helsinki. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, virtually, but uh, considering the uncertainty and the circumstances, uh, uh, that's the best uh, uh, we can do uh, at the moment. So, Bengt, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and thanks so much uh, to, uh, for your willingness to talk about digital platforms from, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, contract theory. Uh, please, screen is yours. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, even virtually participating in this opening and, and welcome to Helsinki, uh, Melis and, and your friends. Uh, I want to talk about uh, digital platforms because uh, that's what I have been studying for for the past year or so. Uh, as a, as a, a, I think a revolutionary form of, of organizing uh, organizing firms, and uh, and uh, that's really my main message in some sense. Platforms have been talked about for a long time. Platforms are very old if one looks at at the concept itself. But uh, in my view, there has been a discontinuity in the, in the past, uh, I would say 10 years or so. That is, uh, the experts have known something about platforms but, uh, or, or being involved with them, but, uh, but the broader community, especially the business community, say traditional businesses, have in my view not paid enough attention to this, uh, I would, perhaps call it an oncoming tsunami. So uh, so you just got to, you, as a business person, you got to at least be informed about uh, why is this happening? Uh, it's not some little fad that will go over and, and, and disappear. In fact, I will put it this strongly. This is the first major business, uh, business uh, plan or, or business form that utilizes effectively, I would say uniquely effectively, the, the capabilities that are provided by digital technology. Digital technologies came, came to the scenes in the 60s, basically, late 60s. I actually worked for a computer science department at Alstom here in Helsinki. I was 23 years old when I, I joined them. And Alstom was one of the few companies that have own computer and I was engaged there to, to basically transform the planning process. There was this dream that when computers came around, you know, everything will change in terms of how companies plan, long, basically long range planning. Now I'm not going to talk more about that because uh, it, uh, it didn't take that long to figure out that computers won't replace people. And, uh, and since then there has been sort of much more focus, I would say, uh, overall in, 
in applying digital technology by replacing some old structures, sort of pouring new wine into old old uh, containers. And, uh, and uh, the platform economy or platform structure is sort of revolutionary in that sense, that it is really a sort of a, a zero start. And, uh, and uh, we will see that it, it has uh, parallels with traditional old, old fashioned marketplaces and so on. But it's still, uh, my point is going to be, it uniquely uses the, the opportunities that digital technology serves. And uh, in that sense, uh, in that sense, it's important. Uh, it's worth noting when I say it's very rather recent that people have realized that you know Steve Jobs, uh, when when he introduced the iPhone, he did plan to actually just make the App Store part of part of the property of of uh, Apple. He didn't like the idea of opening it up, as some suggested, and make it what the App Store actually eventually became. But he was uh, eventually con convinced that he should do that, and so you can imagine what iPhone would be if it was uh, would be proprietary to Apple, as opposed to you know letting people come onto the platform and uh, and uh, develop their own under rules provided by Apple, develop their own own programs and so on. They are they are. Uh, I think they are. Uh, well, I don't know. I think there are a million apps or something like that uh, in, in at least with Android counting in. So this this was just an explosion in the way in the way uh, it developed. And uh, today, Apple actually doesn't report separately the App Store revenue from the from the iPhone revenue because they find it such an integral part of of uh, what the iPhone is. So uh, for a visionary not to see. Uh, roughly 10, 15 years ago, that this would be revolutionary. That's just underlines what I claim. We didn't see it coming. And uh, very few people saw it coming. So uh, uh, I, let me provide a little bit of, of context in terms of, of, of why this isn't just an other, uh, you know, little thing. Uh, if you count uh, the 10 most valuable companies in uh, in the in the uh, in the world, eight of them today are platform based, basically, and they are the typical Apple and Google and so on and so forth. I put the eighth is Tesla. Tesla is really not a car; it is sort of a platform on wheels. That's the way to think about it. And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about Europe's ability to sort of uh, say say Daimler or something. Its dreams about you know overtaking Tesla. I will explain why that's going to be more challenging than Daimler thinks. Uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, Daimler still, I think, think uh, it's all about electricity, but it's actually about the data processing, uh, very much so. And uh, so the, you see it from the valuation, by the way. Tesla is worth about 700 plus billion, and, and, uh, and Daimler is uh, less than. 100 billion or somewhere around 100 billion. You know, what explains that is not that they are uniquely better electric cars. All is in the data. And, uh, and data in general, one might say, has become the driver of wealth today. That's, that's the transformation that has come about with this uh, platform. So uh, still to add to this, you know, very recent data about uh, unicorns. Uh, I see Peter Bestemark there reading his iPhone. You should watch. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, he knows all about unicorns or at least about startups. And, uh, and so 70 to 80% of today's unicorns, this, this last year's unicorns were actually platform-based. So, you know, uh, if you want to become a unicorn, it's almost by definition you are a platform because it scales in a way that uh, traditional firms don't count. Uh, finally, a comment about, uh, about the uh, US. US and China dominate the scene. So all eight of those uh, 10 most valuable companies, six are, are from the US and two are from China. You probably know China, it's going to be Ant, uh, as I call it, Ant, uh, the Ant Group, and, uh, and uh, Alibaba is uh, the name many people 
associated with, but it's really ant now. It's a huge conglomerate, uh, or, or, and uh, and then Tencent, which is uh, the WeChat uh, based. So uh, so those are those are leading, and I must say that I express a concern for Europe because uh, basically there is no big platform in Europe. They sell out to US. Actually, some sell out to China, like Supercell. You know, uh, they, they, they isn't just, uh, you know, the base that's needed in terms of an integrated market. I think that's one of the reasons. But there's also a sort of regulatory mentality that I think is putting some sticks in the wheels of this development. So the, Europe is now going with the regulation ahead, and they think they're going to put regulations in pla place, and then everything will follow. I think the order is, in my view, somewhat wrong, though I don't want to dismiss the importance of regulation. I will also come back to that. Uh, so uh, I'm taking an economic view of this platform. I'm an economist, so for me, so this talk is a big picture talk in the sense that I'm going to give an interpretation of, 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 the, of the platform as an economist. It's such a rich concept, so one can talk about platforms, you know, in a, numerous ways, but my way that I talk about this is, is economic. And the first thing to say is platforms are hundreds, if not thousands of years of old. Marketplaces are platforms. You know, the idea is to bring together people and in order to interact. And so, uh, so uh, platform as a concept is very old. You know, we have uh, shopping malls, is a more modern version of marketplaces. We have uh, exchanges. Uh, you know, stock exchanges and such, those are sort of traditional platforms, if you wish. But, uh, but uh, what's new here is the digital part. And the digital part has transformed this old concept of a platform into something totally different. Because in the old world, uh, basically, they were not expandable. You know, you think about the marketplace, it's constrained by, you know, people have to come there. And there's only so so many people that can go there because uh, for distance, because of space. Uh, shopping malls have a limited space, so everything is constrained by space or or distance in time, and and uh, these were big frictions. So so what what there was the understanding that in order to be able to trade, you know, for sellers to find buyers, and conversely, you have to have something that replaces the frictions that are created by this space. And, and intermediaries was for hundreds of years the answer for the modern economy. You know, intermediaries grew up, more sophisticated intermediaries that would, would intermediate uh, the connections between uh, buyer and seller. Banking is, is, is a, a great example of an intermediary. And, and the problem, if there's enough value, there would be an intermediary that would come in between. And, uh, and uh, that was how you solved it. Some, uh, there was long chains of intermediaries and, uh, and that was sort of the old fashioned way of, of doing things. I'm, I'm, I may come back to this still, but, uh, but they had transaction costs. So intermediaries are not cheap. You know that banks are not cheap. They are not very fast either actually, and so on. So if you ask the first question to ask, and I think key question to ask is, you know, why is it that we have suddenly gotten these uh, gigantically valuable companies uh, arise out of, out of sort of almost nowhere in, in the past uh, 10, 15 years? And the short answer in some sense is, is, is uh, scalability. I'm going to come to enables, but, but you know, the key thing in a platform is as it tries to, just like the old platform, combine you know, sellers and buyers, services with service providers. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, but they can do it at a scale that is enormous now. And the enabler for that scale, of course, is the internet. Or if one is more precise, I think one can say it's the mobile internet. So everybody has you know, access to information, so 24-7, and uh, and uh, that access, so you 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 are you are sort of in the marketplace at any moment at any time, and and the other the scalability concern the fact that the, the the cost of distributing, say a program, to one person, uh, 
versus sending it to 100 million people. I mean, the difference is trivial uh, in, in the digital world. And the speed is phenomenal. You know, I don't know exactly how long it takes to, for a signal to go around the world, but I think it's like a second or something like that. So uh, they zero distance. And the marginal cost is also close to zero. The fixed cost is high, but the marginal cost is close to zero. And so it is this reduction in frictions that has, uh, has uh, come from enable this, uh, this scalability. And uh, so let me just be concrete. You know, China has been totally transformed by this new technology. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it used to be that the Western part of China was uh, completely isolated. People didn't have access to banking. They didn't have access to the kind of goods that Eastern, the developed part of China had. In a matter of 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years, uh, basically they are as close as close to goods and services as is the Eastern part. I have worked with Ant for, for the past three years. So I, I have, that's why I'm using it as my example because I know them well, but it is absolutely sensational. And let me tell you, they are way, way ahead of Europe in terms of what they are doing. And, and, and they are in many ways, for instance, in payment systems, they are well ahead of the US as well. Uh, so they they this it's it's I, I don't want to go into the question of how did it happen but basically one reason that China is in the lead here in, in or, or in on at the front let's call it is actually the fact that they they were so far behind they had only cash and in a matter of few years, suddenly they had digital payments where you just have your phone and your QR code and you flash your phone, you don't touch anything. And the phone knows who you are. So there's no fraud. It's very difficult to do fraud. The, the, instead of credit cards are similar, say, but actually with, with the mobile phone, you just flash it and, and, and the fraud rate is very low. And it can be monitored uh, who you are, as I said before. And, and so, Credit cards, you know, just by, to get some numbers, you know, the fraud rate is some, something like 0.0001 in China. And, and in the US, uh, the credit card, they have a system where they insure the credit card holders. It's, it's of the order of 0.02 or something like that. So orders of magnitude different in, in, in fraud rates. And uh, the US is that way because they insure everything. You know, if I lose my credit card, I, do, I never have to pay anything and that's wonderful, except somebody has to pay it. So I'm, I'm paying it, I'm paying everybody else. I, I have a share in everybody else's uh, screw ups in, <laughs> and then they pay me for my screw ups. So it's a, it's a, that's a massive, I think, reduction in the cost of running it. And you can see it in the US that they now are coming, uh, the, the fight for payments and payment systems with PayPal and, and Stripe and all. Stripe take a value as a unicorn, you know, 100, 100 billion, and it's still listed. You know, all it does is actually tries to clean up the mess in the US payment system. That's, the, that's their business model. Because it's all, you know, there, there's, there's lots of business cards, there's lots of machines you have to stick it in. It, it's a hassle to, to pay something at some ways, a hassle to pay. Actually, it's a, in the US, I think it's worse than Europe uh, in terms of payment systems. So, uh, so that's uh, these kind of frictions that come from, you know, how do you pay, how do you find people, and so on, uh, is uh, is one of, of the big advantages. Another big advantage, is, or a very big advantage, is network effects. That is, when you have this mass of people the access of people so that they, they, they can, instead of having what, what many describe as the pipe, so, so, you know, a company buys something from a supplier and then sells to a consumer, uh, you let the consumer directly inter interact with the supplier. And that creates network effects, typically a two-sided platform. You put them on the platform, so for instance, Ant Financial, uh, Alibaba was a platform, a trading platform, eBay was a trading platform also. Uh, Alibaba, by the way, basically was created from the 
the desire to beat out eBay as the big, uh, biggest uh, company in China. And, uh, and uh, their big idea was to actually uh, create escrow accounts instead of ratings. There's a trust issue when people who don't know each other should trade. You have a trust problem. And the trust problem in, uh, in Alibaba's platform was, or Taobao platform is really called, uh, was to actually take very old fashioned, hundreds of years old idea is to take an escrow. So, so the, the buyer gives the money to, to Taobao and Taobao gives it to the seller only once the buyer is satisfied with the product. So uh, that little trick, so to speak, uh, it got the, the, the Taobao platform to explode. Just to give you a figure, on Singles Day, which is 11-11, that is November 11, which is the big happening, uh, it, their capacity to handle uh, trades is 200,000 tr transactions a second. That's, that's where they are. And they are up at times to over 100,000 transactions a second on that one day. And tens of billions of dollars in one day. So, so you see the scale that absolutely under normal circumstances could not have been possible. So the network effect said, uh, uh, I'm going to come back to the network effect says that the bigger you get, the more desirable the platform gets. So it, it's, once you get going, once you get an established footprint in, in the place, you can, it sort of, the speed just keeps accelerating. And, and I don't want to go into the details about how they interact, you know, the buyers, and buyers increase, and it's more valuable. Take Apple's App Store, you know, when there are more, more people that are on the platform using these apps, then it's more desirable to create apps, and conversely, so they sort of interact, and there's a lot of strategic thought going into how should Apple sort of play, or how should the, uh, the, 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 the companies that... Uh, that control these platforms, how should they price things and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into, into this, but it's a, it's a strategic, strategically in, in, interesting case. A uh, of, of, of final element I want to re, uh, bring up here is that, that you know, these platforms are asset light, or in fact, that they may have no assets. So if you think about Airbnb, which is a, it's, a, it's a platform that just matches buyers and sellers or allows buyers and sellers to match, but, but Airbnb doesn't own anything. So it's just, it, it's enormously valuable. And this is my emphasis, it's enormously valuable to society because it actually increases the, the use of capacity and resources. So you can think of, a, think of, the, think of the case where uh, say the parking garage, uh, I use that often as, as an example of how, how you know, uh, shared property is, is better used. So if you have propriety parking spaces, a reserved parking space, we have all seen it. We drive into the garage and, you know, it's almost empty on the lower floor because somebody has just earmarked the place and they are paying a lot more for the place for having it. But it's half full at best, you know, the reserved places. But then when you go to the free spaces, those are completely filled. So parking garage, by promising you have a place, but you don't have a designated place, is just a hugely more efficient use of that space. In the same way, you know, these assets, uh, to take Airbnb as an example, it's a hugely more uh, efficient way from society's point of view. And if we think about, you know, all the problems with the environment today and so on, this sharing economy, that sort of, comes hand in hand with this digital platform is probably going to play a very big role in, 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 in more efficient use of the limited resources that, uh, that are, are really needed here. And so, uh, so that's, uh, uh, those are the, in some sense, the economic drivers, you know, why? Of course, all of this has been enabled by technology. So, so nothing of this, so the mobile internet I mentioned already, I would put it very high up. I think being, being uh, Finns here, we are, you are in Finland right now. I know this is an Estonian meeting, but, but uh, you know, Nokia has been beating up left and right for you know, falling down. Nobody seems to realize it went up to 280 billion. It was one of the 10 most valuable companies in, in 2000. I mean, how did that happen? 
in eight years, by the way, from bankruptcy essentially to 280 billion. The traditional business, they were not a platform. You know, they were not a software company. I think this is a world record that's going to stand in terms of, of the speed of growing. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that their mobile phone strategy was to actually go, to, they, they were very much paying attention to, to the low income countries, China, India, uh, Africa, and so on. And, and, and in, at some social level, the services that has provided for, for the world uh, makes me still very proud for having been part of the part of the board of Nokia. Not that I did anything. Let, let me emphasize, I didn't do anything for this, but I'm just proud for being, being Finnish and for being part of Nokia. So I think we should talk about that and not talk about how it stumbled. Uh, because after all, when it stumbled, we have gotten a lot of good companies around it again. So this is part of the business dynamic and it's, there's no reason to, to, to cry about it. Uh, so uh, the enables, that was a little detour into the mobile internet. The cloud has, uh, has been a response to all this demand, but the cloud is absolutely essential because uh, you couldn't process 120,000 200,000 transactions a second without the cloud. Uh, AI has played a very important role because of the way it processes and sort of identifies people and recognizes you with a, with a mobile phone. And, and, and then if we take Tesla as an example, you know, the learning loop that comes from, you know, AI and data go hand in hand. So the value of data has come about because of AI basically because uh, it, it is a new statistical method, one can think about it, machine learning especially is a statistical method, for, for gleaning facts out of masses, mass amounts of data that we have just not seen before. That is, uh, we, we have a regression analysis and some simplified models, but actually digging into these massive databases and, and, and and inferring from it, you know, that Melis is really a reliable guy. As, as Ann says, you know, we don't, we, don't know, we, we don't know you, but we know who you are. By that, they mean that they don't know that Melis is Melis, that it's not based on knowing that Melis is a trustworthy guy. We have just looked at how you behaved on the platform. And, and, and we know that. And therefore, actually, we know more about Melis than Melis knows about himself. You know, this is the fascinating thing, is that, that these, it's a scary thing at the same time, but they know more about you in some dimensions than, than you know about yourself. Did you know that you are really trustworthy, Melis? <laughs> Actually, they would find out very quickly that, that, that you are very trustworthy. So, so uh, and they don't look at, you know, I, put, I call it this way credit, for instance, to Western China, this poor part of China, they get small amounts of credit. They did, never had access to credit before, but credit is immensely valuable for growth. And, and it's all based on how they behave, not knowing what they look like, you know, and profiles or anything like that, but just their digital footprint as it's called. You know, they look at the digital footprint and based on that, they can extend that, uh, extend credit to them. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's been enormously valuable in terms of raising, raising these people to, from poverty, making credit inclusive. You know, inclusiveness is a, is a pet word right now. And, and I think for good reason. So my view is, and that's one of the reasons I work with Ant, is that I think it's the, this is the future for actually getting out of poverty for a lot of countries. Africa is an example. So, so you know, Again, it's about raising, using this technology, raising, raising the, 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 the living standard for, for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, I think that's a fa fabulous thing uh, to, to have to do. Uh, on the learning loop though, let me just comment. Did you want to say something, Melis? I can't hear you.
go on. Okay, now you got. What did you say? Did you want to ask something or? Okay, let me go on. So uh, while while you fix this, uh, let me take a, a comment on Tesla uh, and 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 Daimler. You know this. Uh, the reason I said that uh, that Tesla is probably uh, way your head of Daimler for a good good many years is that uh, it is not really just a car or an electric car or something like that. It has one great advantage, which is it has been driving around and collecting data and refining its system for. I said, I think the aim is self-driving cars, but they have they they are they are learning. AI is learning like a child is learning. It just looks at the world and somehow, we don't know how, the child learns to speak, the child learns to not fall, the child learns not to go to certain places or go to, you know, where the candy store is or whatever. You know, the children learn inductively, as we call it. They just take the data, filter it somehow and, 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 and learn. Uh, we lose that ability to a large extent once we grow up and we become deductive. You know, like I'm now analyzing why are these uh, why are these you know uh, platform uh, companies so so successful and valuable and so on and so forth. It is uh, it, it is that's a deductive reason. I'm trying to construct a theory or, or some beliefs so that that I can transport these ideas you know to some to some other places. And and uh, so Tesla is like a ten year old maybe now or seven year old, but Daimler is just zero years or one year old. And for Daimler to think that they just by sort of, they are behind in this data race. So it will take them a, a good deal of time to sort of get the learning of like going from one year old to 10 year old. Uh, and, and that gap, you don't just jump and put more money into it and then you jump there. You have to just process this data and, and sort of the everyday data that comes from traffic and so on. And 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 so I think I think this uh, this the 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 Tesla is a very smart machine and it gets constantly smarter and and in that race about being smart uh, uh, the Chinese are very big on explaining this fact that the data is the source of smartness and and uh, and you cannot uh, make very very quick jumps so. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, about the strategic opportunities. This is a business school. You know, um, what does this all lead to? Well, I think the one, two big things jump out. One of which is that uh, that you should look for if you think about where to enter something, a new business or something. In some ways, you are looking for where there are frictions, where there where there are inefficiencies in terms of transaction, either informational frictions, so that uh, like. Like lending is a friction, high friction activity, uh, uh, and 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 therefore fintech is now coming in, just like uh, Ant did originally. The fintechs are all over the place. They are, I think, fintech are accompanied by the way startups are about half of the all the startups right now. So there's a very big uh, activity in the fintech space, and they are trying to basically make the banking system hugely more efficient, and they will succeed. You know, there's no question in my mind that they will succeed. Will they get digital currencies or something? That's a different discussion that uh, I, I can, I can, we can have, you know, in the Q&A, but, but I don't have right now uh, time to talk about that. But FinTech is a, is a very big apl application. So frictions is what you can look at and, and, uh, and uh, find, find sort of opportunities. Of course, the frictions, uh, the obvious frictions has long since already been discovered, you know, with the Ebays and the Taobao's and so on. So, so to some extent uh, or increasing extent, you have to come up with, with things that don't exist because there was a friction. Nobody has even tried. It. It's not that there's something that's inefficient. It's that there's nothing, you know, and you, you have to, that cre cre requires a different degree of creativity of seeing that if I created this, there would be a demand for it. And, and, uh, and so we are entering a stage where I think the demands for entering, uh, entering this, uh, this uh, digital marketplace is 
harder on the consume on the on the B2C business, that is from, from business to consumers. I think the opportunities right now, if we look forward, is in, in transforming traditional businesses still, like uh, like you know, Kone has already taken quite a quite a or invested quite a bit in this in this uh, this transformation uh, of, of basically businesses are opening up. In order, it's not just to remove frictions, but it is also to you know, engage with a much, much broader innovation system than what is traditional, and much, much broader range of partners than is traditional. And so, so uh, I think that's part of what's so exciting looking forward is to see that that uh, that businesses businesses can really take advantage of. So think of Amazon. Amazon is has been really a leader in this respect. That is, they they have they came up with their own platform for how to distribute goods. You know, they sold like they were like a Taobao platform. They sold goods, but in the end, they decided that that, that you know maybe they will make, make more money if we open up our proprietary system for third party sellers. And actually, today the third party sellers is a bigger business for them than their original, you know, having goods in store and selling. They, of course, started with books, but they have sort of gone all over the map. And they are competing. Paradoxically, they are, they are sort of using the same platform. They are competing with these third party sellers and they are trying sometimes to steal the ideas and so on and so forth. But they are taking a 30% share or something of that order. I don't know exactly what the number is. But the point is, you know, they gave away sort of 70% uh, potentially, but but they the scale of the business has absolutely exploded, and 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 that's the way they have been making the making money. What's less known is that they did the same with the cloud computing. The cloud computing in the cloud they have these servers, and the cloud is very efficient. Again, it's like a sharing economy. So they have they have in the cloud they have just a limited set of programs because not everybody uses them. For instead of distributing Windows 10, you know, to everybody a package and putting on machine, they have it in the cloud, you know, and they have to they in this parking space analogy, they only have to have a or, or have much fewer of these programs uh, uh, at any given time. So they had this system and they had these services, uh, incidentally, and also had these services, you know, various kinds of services for small businesses or how, so that they don't have to have their own systems running. And, and, um, and so um, it's sometimes called software as a service. Uh, uh, and it's growing very much. That, that's one of the manifestations of this, show, uh, this sharing economy. But then they made, did something, I mean, Bezos is really a bold guy. I mean, he just decided one day, he got convinced that actually what they need to do is they need to open up the whole thing. Their proprietary platform, you know, their, 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 their cloud computing platform. They just should, they, they just are going to go and make, under certain rules, they are going to make it available to everybody. And, uh, and so uh, the rules, one of the key instruments here is the application programming interface. That is how you can sort of connect into the system, uh, be that Apple's you know, App Store or be that, uh, the, be that Amazon's cloud computing. But I tell you, today, with this move, uh, the move was done, I think, in, in quite early. But, uh, but uh, this move has made uh, cl the cloud computing app Amazon's biggest business. 60% of the money uh, from Am for Amazon comes from this cloud computer. So you see how he has migrated. You know, migration is a very important word here. You know, you have to have an open mind. You have to have a sort of business 2.0 or is it 3.0 mindset. You know, you try something. If it works, you continue. If it doesn't work, you, you, you know, you pivot and so on. So, so Amazon is, is uh, I mean, Bezos is uh, probably a difficult person to deal with, but I must say that he's a, he's a brilliant mind in terms of, of understanding this. So how he saw this as being the right thing to do. And you have, 
it's uh, maybe I should uh, uh, maybe I leave it to the, the the sort of stories how he did it is also very interesting. But uh, but so let me summarize uh, kind of from a contract theoretic point of view. You know what we are seeing. Traditionally, you got to be powerful and create value uh, as a company by having activities, proprietary activities, by having assets that brought people to the company. And you were like an island economy. So it, it, it was like a, I, would, I don't want to use the word dictator, but the company was not a democracy. You know, it set the rules of the game. You can think about, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a child, you know, if you, had, if you owned all the assets with which the game was played, you could set the rules of the game and decide what was being played. We learned that uh, as children already. So that's, that's how these companies were. They had the assets, and with the assets, they could control the human capital. And the human capital was attracted. Of course, you can't set stupid rules. So one of the big theories, or, or, and theorems, I would say, in uh, the sort of coast theorem is basically saying that you will actually take care, good care of your workers. If you are the residual claimant, you own it, you, you get the thing, you are not going to try to extract surplus from the workers, that's unreasonable. You are going to follow their desires to the extent it is increasing the total pie. So, so this system of having one owner and having, ha having shareholders sort of own things uh, and, and, and in that sense be under control is actually a highly efficient system. Also for the work and also for the suppliers and everybody that depends on the company. So uh, I'm very much in the camp of, you know, uh, the stakeholder sort of movement that we see now. Uh, I'm skeptical about, you know, we, we can get into it, but, but, you know, this is the reason shareholders own, because they are a very homogeneous group and they are trying to maximize, you know, basically profit or, or you know, the value of the company. And, and, and that's why they have been so successful over the years. And it's good for society under, under, re, under reasonable constraints. And now what we are seeing is that this sort of having control, this tightly specified, uh, is really being challenged by you know, this, this opening up of the firm. That is, uh, that is, this digital technology is not you know, it, it doesn't come to its full potential in this old fashioned model of a closed, closed firm that owns assets. So in order to kind of get the same power and, and, and creativity that you see in the business to consumer market that I described uh, and these platforms, you create platforms for your partners so that they come and see what happens inside your firm. And again, Amazon is extreme. I mean, they have let they have they let all their partners to see what's happening inside the firm. So Bezos said we have to use the same APIs, you know, inside the firm as outside the firm, with some constraints. But you know, basically, he's opened up his firm and made it transparent, and and uh, and he did it by the way with one email where he said, "This is what we are going to do." That's called the Bezos Manifest, you know. And he said, for those who don't do it, we'll be fired. And he ended it by saying, have a good day. Uh, and, 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 you know, this is, this is in one email. The whole strategy of Amazon was changed. And that's the, the message here is you have to make a bold move. And you have to get everybody to do it at pretty much the same time. So... Uh, these are some, uh, some uh, thoughts. There's a lot of strategy we could talk about. You know, one of the things is about fostering community and so on. But I didn't want to, I wanted to kind of come to this transition from, you know, this controlling kind of uh, centralized, if you wish, uh, traditional firm to, you know, this new form where the firm has to open up its borders and, and let partners in. 
And the most extreme company that I know of that, that does that is actually a company called Hayo. It's a Chinese company. It's basically, you can go, they, they are really just the marketplace, the whole company. And so the outsiders of the company can come in and actually start something, suggest some new business and, 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 and you know, use the workers in hire to conduct it and so on and so forth. So you should, if you have the opportunity, I don't, I see that my time is up. So if you have the opportunity, read about hire and, and, and try to understand it, that it's functioning. It, it, it is a fascinating story. It happens to be the world's largest white wear company. So it's not like a flash in the pan, some little company doing something crazy. It is actually the biggest uh, white wear company, meaning wash, washers and dryers and you know TVs and all, all sorts of 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 of, of, of uh, so so they have managed to to make their model somehow work. I, I must admit that I don't fully understand how it's working, um, but uh, but uh, it is an interesting example. So let me suggest that we can talk. You know, there are many negatives with platforms, especially with networks externalities, and maybe we can have a chance to discuss that. Thank you. Thank you, Bengt. I hope you can hear me now. I mean, uh, sorry about the problem before. Um, let me follow up immediately with some questions. Um, you criticized uh, European companies for uh, selling out. Uh, and uh, what do you, I mean, could you elaborate on that? And what is, what is the problem, really? I mean, if we connect it with our previous discussion about game industry ecosystem uh, here in Helsinki, so what's the problem of uh, Supercell uh, selling majority shares to Tencent? Uh, does it somehow alter Finnish uh, game industry ecosystem? Does it take away certain opportunities? Uh, maybe the... You know, those who benefited from this transaction, maybe they will invest it into some other ventures. So uh, what's, the, um, what's the main concern we should have? Thank you. Well, I, I didn't mean to criticize the companies. You know, I, I think companies do, you know, what's best for the companies. I'm not, I, I don't believe that <laughs> there's anything... I'm criticizing more the governance structure or the, or, or the, how the economy is set up that this happens, that they have to go or they go there. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement of they have fallen behind and it's not clear how they are going to catch up very quickly. And it's true that, that you know, uh, if they sell out, sometimes it doesn't matter, you know, is the, so is, is the owner or a foreigner or not a foreigner is less important historically than where is the work done and and uh, and uh, with the new rules about uh, global taxation if they come to pass you know it's going to be important to see what what where 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 is stuff consumed and and so so but somehow it is a, a generic belief that if you are in the business of developing this frontier companies and these big companies, you see what's happening in China, if you see what's happening in, in, in the US, I mean, you see the, the, the human capital that's drawn into those companies and, 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 and so forth, they, they, are, they are a different order of magnitude, I think, than, than what's happening in Europe. And Europe is sort of making its bet on B2B. Thank you. And um, the question about uh, network effects, I mean, uh, yeah, you emphasize that it uh, leads to this sort of winner takes it all uh, type of uh, world where US and Chinese uh, platforms uh, dominate. So if you take this um, linear logic further, I mean, the bigger companies, bigger platforms get bigger. So does it imply that uh, Europe has no chance at all? At the, at the same time, we had this discussion in the morning, and for instance, Peter uh, Westerbakka emphasized that you know we shouldn't benchmark ourselves against Silicon Valley because uh, here we can do things differently. So maybe if we break this linear linear logic, maybe you know we can do the next big thing here. Uh, well, I don't. I would call it linear. It's actually a non-linear logic okay, because sorry. if you have a hundred people and you add one, it's a hundred times. More okay, sorry. And, yeah, and my, my mistake. A, you know, it, it's every every additional person makes it 
more valuable for the next one to join. So that's that's the network. It's not the network externality. It's a network effect. Actually, I should use that word. Uh, but but uh, yes, uh, well, uh, you can speak to this personally yourself. Uh, you know, we, we can have, this is a good conversation. There's no question there's room. You know, we, I think, I think we are just taking off, you know, I think this, this is, we are, we are sort of at, at midway of the runway or, or shortly we are we're going to lift up and, and the young people, you know, uh, I don't know how many are young in the audience, but I think it's the, it's the, the pilots of this thing that is about to take off are the 40 year olds or 30 or 40 year olds or, 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 or younger people now. So, so uh, I think there's more, a lot of optimism uh, in my mind that this, this will take off, but still, you know, they, there's, the, there's just the knowledge capital that, that has accumulated a lot more, I believe in, in Silicon Valley and maybe Peter, Peter has, uh, has as a different point of view, but there's totally room. You know, this is a gigantic, uh, a gi gigantic shift, and there's certainly room to innovate a lot. I mean, Estonia has been very innovative. Uh, well, by the way, one place where, where Europe obviously leads is is in the in the government on the government side. You know, the various platforms that they have already created in Finland and and together with Estonia and so on. So. So those things, those community sites are, are certainly in Europe more developed. So I don't think the game is over. Um, one more, uh, you also suggested that we can talk about some of the negative effects. And one of the big issues is that uh, platforms in one, one side, they are marketplaces, but they are also rule makers uh, in those marketplaces. And that creates all kinds of conflicts of interest. and. Uh, there is this increasing literature on uh, platform-dependent entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, what could be the, some of the possibilities to overcome uh, those challenges? And uh, perhaps it's not even just about businesses. Maybe countries like Estonia and Finland should be particularly concerned because uh, they're very small markets. And if someone here would want to get in touch with someone in Apple, uh, would be very very challenging. Maybe they don't pick up the, I mean, in the Apple's uh, management, they don't pick up the phone. So what about this sort of platform dependency and some of the risks uh, emerging from, uh, you know, basically having too large uh, ecosystems around uh, particular firms? I think it's a relevant concern. I mean, the, the negative network effects uh, are, are in, 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 there is social value in network effects in, the, in that things grow faster and we are coordinated together on, on, on some, we are focused on the same, say, standards or something like that. That's valuable socially. But we know, of course, that, uh, that it's, uh, you know, if, if you get monopolies, then you have a problem. And, and, uh, and we have basically all these, uh, all these big firms, with the exception perhaps of the Chinese, Tencent and, and, and Tencent and Ant are, are pretty competitive, but uh, we we have the problem that uh, that uh, you know uh, they they are they are uh, they are monopolies and 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 you can see that they are cracking down. China is cracking down because of uh, I think partly for the same reasons actually. Some of it may be political, but uh, but uh, there is a concern about the size and and the fact that governance uh, from the Things that we feel the government or the public should be under control of uh, is slipping into the hands of, of, of uh, you know, these big companies. Uh, I'm thinking now about Facebook and, you know, elections and, and, and things like that. These are pretty scary, scary prospects coming from, from this explosive growth. So I think, I think that's, uh, I don't have an answer of how to address it, but I, I think it will be addressed or has to be addressed. All right. And thank you. Uh, is it all right if we take also a few questions from the audience? Yeah. If we have in a small yeah. group, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask uh, uh, from Bengt? Uh, yeah, Catherine. Hello, I'm Catherine Tano from uh, HEC Paris, and I'm quite interested in the EduTech and the future of uh, education 
technology and platforms. If you can say something about that. Thank you. Thank you. That would have been my next question, actually. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, the platformization of education. What are the? Yeah, well, I, I think I think we have we have chatted a little bit about that uh, with with uh, with uh, Milis, uh, but uh, uh, I think it is massively. It's in for a massive, uh, you know digitalization transformation. Uh, that doesn't mean that, I don't think campuses will disappear. I think creative activities require that we are face to face until, you know, the technology becomes, you know, something where we are, we are sort of, we are in person almost in the same place, even if distance is long, but, but I mean, we all know you have, you are creative people, you know, that, you know, ideas flow a lot more freely when you have a blackboard or a whiteboard, say. And I mean, the whiteboard is a magical tool for creativity. And, and I don't think that's very readily replaced, but, but uh, we see already now, I mean, YouTube is, is, uh, is a wonderful uh, educator. I use it a lot if I want to learn something new, you know, some of what I said or, or, or today or rather written down, I didn't get to speak about a lot of it, but uh, it comes from YouTube. And then you learn to discriminate it. And of course, the whole internet provides information. But I think there is, there, there are, again, you, you may look at frictions, you may look at network effects. I think there is an opportunity. Even for a small country, as we have thought, Estonia would be a good example. You know, it doesn't have that much legacy structure, so to speak. And, and, and the less there is legacy structure, the easier it is to actually do something disruptive. And and uh, and so why I, I think in that sense uh, the opportunities are there and and if uh, Alton University is actually a good example you know it started its startup business uh, it it was disrupt the fact that it's not of course quite a new university it's it's combining universe but this combination uh, somehow disrupted the normal state of affairs and and and, and students uh, got to be more creative so. I think the opportunities are enormous there. I think the opportunities in healthcare are enormous. They are starting to be used, but I think there are a lot of industries that are going to be ripe for a, a big time trans transformation. And and, uh, and those two would be, be good examples, but I don't have, uh, I don't have, you know, I haven't put my mind through, you know, how to change it. I'm worried a little bit about MIT actually, in the sense that it, it has such a strong tradition that I worry that somebody's just going to leapfrog. Just like, just like you know, China leapfrogged on payment systems. They, their advantage was that they were disadvantaged and <laughs> that they didn't have any, they had cash. They didn't have credit cards, they didn't have checks. They, can, they, they just jumped. They, the, the value of jumping was huge for them. Whereas for, for the United States, the jump is much smaller and therefore people are lazy and they are sort of satisfied with the status quo. So the, val the value of this move, that's the logic of why being behind or starting from zero is, 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 has a certain benefit. And, and, and so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, Estonia or something like that came up with a big platform. Melis is uh, thinking about it. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for those kind words. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts. And um, I think it, this is a good topic to end uh, uh, today. But our conversation about platformization of education will not stop here. We can uh, continue on some other occasion, as we discussed it uh, a few days ago. So uh, thanks again, Bank, for joining us. I uh, appreciate that uh, you were able to spend uh, one hour with us and share your talks. And uh, have a uh, good morning. Good morning. Can, in, uh, can, can I just answer this? This somebody who has asked a question here in the chat, but you don't have. It is just briefly. He asked that do you do you think digital platforms can help rapidly reduce global greenhouse gas emission? If so, how? Uh, I leave the if so how away and just answer. I think I think. Uh, I think absolutely digital platforms will be essential. And again, China has actually, and has, has you know, it, China likes to gamify everything. 
you know, so they, they, they don't just introduce things and say, here's this new platform. They make it a game in some sense to join. And, and that's how WeChat got very quickly into payment system and so on. They, they, they are game players. And, and so they have a game for actually where you, you, you compete with your friends and others on the platform and, and the surprise you, you get to plant a tree, you know, and they have planted, uh, I don't know, I, my guess would be maybe 500,000 trees already in, in the desert or somewhere in, in, in China. You know, it has been massively successful, this tree game. As a, as a price. So, so that's an example of, of something that they have done. But then again, the sharing economy, the whole sharing economy is a big exercise in you know, reducing the footprint of, of uh, using much more effectively the resources we have, the, 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 the consumer. So uh, reducing waste. But, uh, but I'm certain that digital platforms will be absolutely central to coordinating. I think, I think this is the way the APIs will be a way for countries to coordinate and follow, you know, uh, uh, you know who, what are the emissions and so on. So yes, I'm, I'm actually surprised that the discussion that I have seen has, has been so limited that uh, I, I would think that this, this is a really, big area so thanks for asking that question thank you and that nicely connects also our uh, topics of the summer uh, school uh, which are uh, sustainability and digitalization so thanks so much Spank, uh, for um, for uh, sharing your time with us and um, uh, have a good uh, morning in uh, boston thank you bye-bye And uh, thank you for all listening. Um, so uh, our summer school will continue tomorrow morning, nine o'clock in Dublin. So, uh, <laughs> so I hope you will make it back. Uh, now you have a little bit free time in Helsinki, and ferry leaves uh, 7:30. But uh, please, you know, be there on time because they start boarding people already 18:50. Uh, they close the gates 19:10. Uh, so don't miss your ferry. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, have a, yeah, see you. Uh, have a good evening.